Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here in front of this group. Uh, I always love speaking to the Heartland people because you put on a great conference and you really get people engaged. I want to engage you in a subject that concerns me a great deal. <clears throat> I believe that science, my investigations of global warming made me very suspicious about what was going on in climate science. And then I began to wonder if we could generalize what is going on in climate science to other areas of science. I'm afraid that the picture is not very good. You might want to call this talk the distorting uh, effect of the incentive structure in the modern academy. So let's first ask why we should care. Well, because our regulatory state claims a basis in science. Scientists say that we're all going to die. Only a skeptic would say, probably funded by the insurance industry, would say that we're not. Regulatory agencies rely on summary science. Reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the US Global Change Research Program. And these documents are essentially large literature reviews. These documents do not lie. They summarize a literature. And if the literature is systemically poisoned, then the report will be distorting. Now, how, what, what is with the incentive structure in science? Let's talk about the incentive structure in the academy. Here, it's time for you to be promoted from assistant to associate professor. You're going to get three questions. The first one is, how much money did you bring in? The second one, part B of that question, is how much of it was federal money? because industry money is not as prestigious as federal money. Question number two, how many papers did you publish? Question number three, how much more money did you bring in? Well, that is the key to professional advancement. Now, what happens is I, I have a, a lecture, a talk that I'm going to give some of tomorrow on how this all happened. It's very interesting. But the universities are addicted to federal funding. When you apply for a million dollars at a university, they tack on another 50% that they call overhead. So the science departments wind up funding the Germanic language department, which can't pay for itself. Aha, think of the roots of political correctness. The roots of political correctness in the university are largely based upon the fact that the university must cheerlead for because it needs the money of big and bigger government. It never saw a big program it didn't like because you can get money from big federal programs. So the, the, the university is systemically to the left as a result of all this. And we get reports like this, the report from the United States Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, these reports have their problems. One of them, the second assessment report, was changed dramatically after it was finalized to indicate a, quote, discernible human influence on global climate that was not merited in the literature. And then we get these reports from the U.S. Global Change Research Program, the U.S. GCRP, $2.3 billion a year. That may not sound like much in a country that is running $800 billion deficits a year, but it's a heck of a lot of money spread over very few people. And they are asked by Congress, they have to produce a report every four or five years, summarizing the impacts of their uh, climate science on the United States. Well, do you think that they're going to go around and say it's no big deal? Nobody takes their wallet out of their pocket and says, I don't want any more money. Please go away. It's not important. When Senator Gore, a junior senator, was holding hearings in the early 1990s, he would ask the administrator of NASA, is global warming so important that your agency could use another billion dollars to study it. Do you expect the administrator to say no? Do you expect the scientists who are working for the administrator to send in proposals that say this is an overblown problem? Do you expect someone to write a manuscript and submit it to Nature magazine? Who's going to review it? All the other people getting all that federal money. And when, if they write a manuscript and says this is an overblown problem, the sensitivity is not as high as it was thought, that paper is liable to get massacred. If you send in a proposal, it says this problem is going to kill billions. It's worse than we thought. The paper will be accepted. And guess what? More billions will appear. So there are biases in science, OK? One of them is called publication bias, and it's something that everybody knows about. We only publish positive results. Negative results do not appeal 
to the journal uh, uh, people, and they don't appeal to your funder. Oops, excuse me, you gave me a million dollars, and my hypothesis turns out to not be correct. Now, if what I'm saying is true, I better come up with some evidence about this. And by the way, I'm going to by the end of the talk that I think is going to you're going to find quite shocking. But there are other things going on in science besides publication bias. I call this one flashy bias. Here is Randy Sheckman. He won the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine. That's not a typo. That's what it's called. Uh, and in December of last year, and the day before, he put an editorial in the London Guardian. How journals like Nature, Cell, and Science are damaging science. This is another guy who's just about to get a Nobel Prize. And he says, I'm not sending any more manuscripts to Nature, Science, and Cell because they're damaging science. Why are they damaging science? Because uh, uh, they publish stuff that will get in the news. And there's all kinds of science that really is very, very solid science. It's very important science but they don't get there. Now, if you publish in Nature and Science, that's a ticket to tenure, okay? So that means that scientists are going to gravitate towards subject areas that guarantee, guarantee publication in these journals. Uh, that will guarantee academic tenure and raise the likelihood of substantial federal research awards. So it's a positive feedback loop. Number two, and most important in the incentive structure, is that will keep you out of coach. That's really, really important to the traveling academic. Uh, and scientists will therefore gravitate toward research topics that will get published in Nature or Science. Hence, Randy Sheckman, a lefty, getting a Nobel Prize, says, I'm not supporting this. Science is being degraded. And just when I was preparing for this talk, uh, the, uh, I, 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 this is the first version of the talk I gave, I just went online that very day to see in the mail, apocalypse now, unstoppable man-made climate change will become a reality and could make New York, London, and Paris uninhabitable within 45 years. And this was published in Nature. Now, I ask you, does anybody really believe that? You know, the largest warming scenarios for New York City that you could possibly imagine would be four degrees Celsius in the summer. The difference in mean summer temperature between New York and Miami is about eight degrees Celsius. All this will do will be to save rich people in Manhattan the expense of having to move to Miami when they retire. It's not gonna do anything else than that, even if it were so bad. Now, haha, <laughs> climate science. Climate science is not subject to these biases. I just thought you'd like to know that. In the case Mass v. EPA, which is the case that the president uses to justify his regulation of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. We don't need your stinking legislature, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> the case uh, was, there were many amicus briefs submitted to the case Mass v. APA in which that result did come out. And one was sent in by a group called the climate scientists. The climate scientists were pretty much anybody who's got a truckload of money and by the way, is a member of the US Global Change Research Program, which is destined to produce a report every five years that says it's worse than we thought. And they wrote this. Outcomes may turn out better than our best current prediction, but it is just as possible that environmental and health damages will be more severe than the best predictions. Okay, folks, what happens in climate science, and you gotta re remember this, people make statements of fact that are testable hypotheses. The operative words there are just as possible. It means that each new modeling result or each new impact result could have the result being it's worse than we thought or it's not as bad as we thought. And you know, if you look at the climate models, hey, well, wow, maybe that's true. This is from the last UN report, not the most current one, but the current one's similar. Here's warming projections from the ensemble of models used by the UN uh, for the A1B emission scenario. And yeah, here's the average value, the solid line. It looks like there's a 50-50 chance that each model, in fact, is better or worse than the previous one. So I decided to test this hypothesis, and I looked at 13 months of science in Nature magazine, threw all the articles I could find into three, on global warming or its impact, into three piles. It's better than we thought, it's worse than we thought, or I can't really classify it um, doing that. And my colleagues made a hypothetical statement to the Supreme Court. 
They said that the predictions should have an equal opportunity of being better than we thought or worse than we thought. Well, I know what you're going you're to be shocked. There are 115 articles on climate change or its impact. 23 were neutral. Nine were not as bad as we thought. 83 were worse than we thought. So that's like throwing a coin 92 times and getting nine or fewer heads or tails. Easy to test under binomial probability. You want to know any, how many times you have to, to flip a coin 92 times and have a 50% chance of getting nine or fewer heads or tails? I don't know what that number is, but that's it on the bottom of the screen. And then people complained about that. I published that in Sonia's journal, e and &E. People complained about that and said, you didn't look at enough years. You have, must have had a biased sample or something like that. Well, sure. So let's look at a lot more years, and let's look at a bunch of, uh, I'm sorry, more journal articles, different journals. I just wanted you to take a look at the aggregate number on the right-hand side. The uh, number of times you have to flip a coin uh, 356 times to get 72 or fewer heads or tails one time is 10 to the 46th power. There are not 10 to the 46th stars in the universe. So what am I doing about this? Well, this is obviously a systematic problem. And it's not just climate science. So I persuaded the powers at Cato to let me create the new Center for the Study of Science. And our first recruit was none other than Richard Lindzen from MIT, is a distinguished senior fellow. Cato has had, I think, 10 distinguished senior fellows. Uh, two of them have won Nobel Prizes. The second one is Ed Calabrese, the most important regulatory science scientist that you have never heard of. Ed Calabrese's work is common sense. Common sense is the, the thing that you live by. All you old girls and, and, and guys out there, half of you are taking chronic medication. You know what? You take a small dose of it, you get better. You live longer. Beta blockers are known to reduce all-cause mortality. You take the whole jar, maybe with some booze, and you might be able to stop your heart. So the fact of the matter is that small things that are poisonous, small amounts of things that are poisonous in large doses are oftentimes beneficial. You are adapted to this thing called sunlight. Without it, you die. You do not synthesize vitamin D. You go out in it without your clothes on and without a building, you die from exposure in the short term or from cancer in the long term. That's the therapeutic model that we live by, but the regulatory model is that the first photon of ionizing radiation is capable of causing cancer. The first molecule of a carcinogen is capable of causing cancer. Even though our DNA is being destroyed internally at much greater rates than natural occurring carcinogens. Why? Because Charles Darwin wants me and you and everybody in this room out of the picture. We're too old. They're going to give us cancer if we live long enough. Now, I want to tell you this. It's not just climate scientists, science, science rather. This is another guy you haven't heard of, Daniele Finelli from the University of Montreal, Scientometrics 2012. Negative results are disappearing from most, in most disciplines and countries. Fewer and fewer negative results are appearing in the literature. That's impossible. That can only result because of systematic incentives. An example here, there's, here's the percentage of papers reporting support for the tested hypothesis. I hypothesis, hypothesize A causes B, and indeed it does. More and more. Do you think people are getting systematically more intelligent? Pick up a newspaper. So, the worst part is this. The reason I brought in my first image is how to get promoted in the university, what the questions that are being asked is, that that model for promotion and in some cases tenure, I made it to full professor, but it was a non-tenurable line. Uh, that model is being increasingly adopted around the world. And what Finelli has found in succeeding work is that the more a country adopts the American model, the more the number of positive results goes up. You can test this by looking at multi-authored papers. You can have papers that have all foreign authors or one American author on them. 
If there's an American author on it, the likelihood that the results are positive is much greater than if it's all foreign authors. We are destroying science with federal money. A fact, Terence Keeley, new fellow in the Center for the Study of Science, wrote the book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research. Prior to World War II, almost all scientific research was privately funded. The great discoveries of physics were made the, 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 in, in the absence of federal programs. The basic research that resulted ultimately in the understanding of the human genome occurred in the absence of federal programs. But now I want to stop this talk with corruption writ large. Okay, a little bit of math. There are 105 climate models that the United Nations used in their last document, 107. You can get 105 of them on a website called KNMI Explorer, and you can run them backwards for various periods of time. So we could run them backwards for, say, 2004 through 2013, have a 10-year period, they'll predict an average warming, and there'll be a spread around that warming. It turns out they're normally distributed. So you can apply standard parametric statistics. Every year, these models are giving you a mean warming for a trend length of, say, 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, all the way back from 1951 to now. And that has a mean value, and it has a standard deviation, and it has a 95% confidence limit and a 97.5% confidence limit. Now, I hope you are wearing your lead underwear because we are about to show you the thermonuclear explosion of the climate models. Okay? The black solid line are the average warmings predicted by these models. The right-hand side is the shortest period. That's ten, the last 10 years. This is the last 11 years. This is the last 62 years, out of 1951. The light-colored lines are the 95 and 97.5 percent confidence limits about those predictions. And the colored dots are the observed temperatures from the Hadley Crew 4 temperature record. Note number one. Where they're green, they're within the 95% confidence limits. Every prediction, every last one of them, Roy, for any period in length is below the average predicted by the model ensemble. That's remarkable. And 37 years ago, this year, they fall below the 0.05 level. They fall outside the 95% confidence limits. And four years after that, the dots turn red, and they're out 97.5% confidence limits. They pop back into the 0.05 in the last 10 years. When, some, when a hypothesis fails at the 5% level, an ethical scientist says, there's something wrong with my hypothesis. That's a moral decision. If you can't do that with this, I can tell you what's going to happen. Every day that my profession delays acknowledging the explosion that has occurred, the collateral damage is going to get worse and worse and worse. And it's not going to be just to climate science. It's going to be to science in general. What a tragedy was created by global warming. And guess what? It was forecast. This guy was the president of Columbia University. I don't know if you know who he was. He got another job after that. Uh, and <clears throat> after eight years on that job, his hot contract said that he could not work longer than eight years on it. And he had to, by tradition, give an exit interview, if you will, or an exit negative interview, i.e. a speech to the American people. It was President Eisenhower's farewell address. And in it includes the famous statement about the military-industrial complex and the councils of government. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence. The potential for disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Oh, the left loved that one. <laughs> My friends in the academy on the left forgot to read the next two paragraphs. The free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discoveries, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research, partly because of the huge costs involved. A government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity and, by the way, a, a way out of coach. Yet, in holding scientific research and discovery in respect as we should, we must also be aware of the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become a captive 
of a scientific technological elite. Could somebody send that to Dr. Thomas Carl, honorary doctor, master's degree, head of the US National Climatic Data Center, the person who put together the national assessment on climate? Because that is public policy as the captive of the scientific technological elite, him and his friends. The projection, the prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is to gravely be regarded. We must right this ship. You and I, working together, getting the government off the people's backs, de-enslaving, freeing scientists from their government to tell the truth that I think most of them really want to tell you and that I am so very fortunate enough to be able to tell you. Thank you. <laughs>